we're in a series now about uh, hindrances or barriers to spiritual growth. So get your Bibles out and turn to the book of Hebrews in chapter 12. We have looked at several different things. And uh, today I want us to deal with the issue of grace. And uh, how grace fits in our times of trouble and how God is available and also why we don't get the grace we need whenever it's available to us. So I want us to begin at Hebrews chapter 12 and let's look at verse uh, 14. Some of you have been memorizing some of these verses and so uh, this ought to be interesting. Uh, look at uh, verse 14 in chapter 12. Hebrews, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. Now this is one verse where I really like King James for sure because it says uh, it calls Esau a uh, profane person. I like that word profane. It just sounds bad. You know, a profane person. You know? And, and uh, the problem you get into when you start talking about barriers to spiritual growth is you begin to see that there are some important issues. If you don't get them straight, you are hampered all of your life and all of your spiritual life and, and in, in your development. And you become a person like Esau. Now Esau was a part of the family that God had chosen. But he was a profane person. And by profane we mean a person who takes the things of God lightly. As if they don't matter. That was the issue for Esau. He thought the birthright wasn't all that big a deal. He needed a meal. He was hungry. He'd been out hunting a long time. Came back. Obviously, he hadn't caught much because he didn't have anything to eat. And he told his brother he'd make him something to eat. His brother says to him, I'll make you something to eat and if you'll give me the birthright. And the first thing he saw, thought was, it's no big deal. That is exactly the profanity you hear in people's lives who claim to be Christians. As if the things of God mean so little. What does it matter if you're not at worship? What does it matter if you're at worship but not worshiping? What does it matter if you don't read your Bible? What does it matter if you don't memorize scripture? What does it matter if you don't uh, speak quite right? What does it, that's profanity. It is profane. And what that means is that you take the things of God so lightly that when you have a need, he doesn't seem to be around. He doesn't seem, it's like, when is God going to answer my prayer? When is God going to do for me what I need? When is God going to intervene? When is God going to do something? And all of a sudden you find out it's not God who's the problem. It's our own profanity. It's our own profane nature. That's the problem. That we have taken the things of God so lightly. So that we think it doesn't matter. What does it matter if you skip church every once in a while? What does it matter if you miss? Profanity. The issue of grace is what I wanted to look at this morning. In verse 15 it says, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. And so I want us to talk a little bit about what grace is like. But before we get to grace, we probably need to talk, make sure we've got our, our bearings on ourselves. And I sent you something this last week in, in an email. All right. Yeah, in an email that I, I challenge you to read and to look at, and what it was talking about was the issue of uh, um, uh, God choosing us. How many of you got that and read that? Okay. Uh, I need, I'm going to text you next time and say, read the email I sent you. Uh, and some of you don't check your email all that much. And, and I'll, I'll do that. In that little that article I sent you, the guy was talking about he was in a he was teaching a class in, in college uh, about grace and about uh, about God's choosing of us that God has chosen us and that He has elected us and that theological issue of election and that God goes out and grabs people and 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 the argument came back from someone in the class 
What's the deal with God? Why doesn't he just choose everyone? Because, see, right now today, there is a, there is a very prominent position in evangelical Christianity even that God eventually is going to bring everyone to heaven. And that God is a God of love and he would not send anyone to hell. And that is becoming widespread. And, and you talk to anyone in our country, in Christian and non-Christian, and they'll tell you they're all going to heaven. Everybody's going to heaven. I mean, only, only the really bad, bad, bad ones are not going to heaven, but everybody else is. And in movies, you'll see it all the time, there is this predominant feeling that basically God is a God of love and everyone's going to heaven. That assumes something that's incorrect. That assumes that everyone wants God. And everyone wants to be with Him. And everybody is seeking to get to heaven. But that is not what the Bible says. The Bible does not say people are trying to get to heaven and want to be with God. The Bible says no one pursues God. No one seeks after God. Every one of us are wicked in our hearts. Not a one of us really wants God. And so this professor, talking about this issue of election, then says, well, let me explain to you what it's really like. What it's really like is God is standing there in heaven with his arms open wide saying, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He quotes his own words. Romans says, all you got to do is come on. Anybody want to come? And he looks out and everyone is going the other way. There isn't anyone coming to him and saying, I'm on in. Everyone is going their own way. That's the way the Bible explains it. Now, several years ago, when we were living in Houston, Missouri, uh, we, had, uh, we had a possum get into a very large can. And uh, he it was laying on the ground, and he had gotten into it, and I decided I would this possum. And so I just stood the garbage can up. And then this possum is on the bottom of the garbage can. And I look over and I mean, I have never been that close to a possum myself, mm -hmm. personally. And I looked at that possum and he showed me every razor sharp tooth he had in his mouth. He hissed at me. He looked really mean and I thought, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> can you get me? And he just said, and he would hiss. I laughed at him, you know, and I thought, he's trapped, he's got, he's going nowhere, except where I tell him. So I put him in, I took that can, I put it in my car, and I drove out to where our church building was, and we had about four or five acres there, and I thought, I'll let him go out there, you know, and see what happens. So I take him out, and I put the, uh, the can down on the ground, I tip the can over, and he just sits there. And he's like a possum. They play his possum, right? He just gets quiet, just sits there. I kick the can. I do all kinds of things, try to get him out. I finally had to take the can and dump it upside down. He flops out of there. He takes one look at me and he goes, <laughs> gives me this look, <laughs> shows me his teeth. I nudged him with the can a little and he started walking. I get back, I don't know what this thing can do, you know. He starts walking every four steps. He turns around and goes, <laughs> and four more steps. Four more. It had to be 40, 50 yards of <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm sitting there going, what? What's with your attitude? What's with you? Ah, people, that's you. That's me. <coughs> that's our attitude towards God. I'm going to do what I want. I don't care what you think. I want that thing. I want that happy. I want that problem. I want that. I want this. I want that. It's about me. That's what the Bible expresses that our attitude is towards God. You say, well, I'm not that bad. Oh, yes, you are. You just haven't seen it yet. You don't believe it yet. Yes, you are. That's the way the Bible describes all of us. It's just you. It's all of us. And when you get that in your head, then you realize that when God is standing in heaven, Grace looks out at you and says, I want you, and you go. <sighs> and God says, no, I want you. I sent my son to die for you. <sighs> and all of a sudden, he gets a hold of our hearts. And his grace grabs a hold of us. 
change in character, that possum would always be a possum and antagonistic towards me. Without a change in character, you and I are always hissing at God. But when we find grace, God turns us into a little puppet. And we turn to him. The Bible describes that turning as repentance that we repent. When, at that moment, you repent, at that moment when you say, it's not me, it's Jesus, at that moment when you say, I'm a hissing possum, but I have turned to God, and he changes you in that instant, in that moment, then your pursuit is towards him. That defines a Christian. It is one who has turned towards God. One who is coming to him. I had a young man say to me and about six months ago, we uh, led him to a place where he gave his life to Christ in our living room. And he said, he said he had heard a message preached by Mary Jo's dad years and years ago. And he said, I was always running from God. And for the first time in my life, I'm running to God. That's a Christian. That's a person who has changed. That's a person whose character is no longer hissing at God. It is a person who has changed into a puppet who wants to love God and serve Him and follow Him. And it is grace that does that. There was no way for that possum to change. It was always going to be a possum. It was always going to be according to his character. It was always going to be antagonistic to me. That is a person without Jesus. But grace reaches down and changes us inside. Now, if you haven't experienced change inside, you're a hissing possum to God. That's all you are. You're antagonistic and you're walking away. What you need is grace. Now the grace of God has reached down to us in Jesus. Has come to us and grabbed a hold of our hearts and it's changed our character. It's changed our outlook on life. It's changed everything about us. And now we no longer pursue our own ends. We no longer pursue our own desires. We no longer pursue our own wants. We now pursue God's desires. What we run into then is this verse. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. And then he says, so that no root of bitterness grows up in you. And we talked a few weeks ago about this issue of forgiveness and bitterness growing up. If you don't pursue grace in your Christian walk, you will revert to the possum of your own nature. You'll revert to it. And you'll do things you shouldn't do. Because it's, a, it's an entrance into grace that gives you the ability to be a little puppy before God. I like them. Don't you like little puppies? They're so cute. I'm not allergic to them. Notice I said, I didn't say cat. Those cats bug me. You know, I sneeze and stuff. But little dog, little puppy. I just love little puppy. I play with little puppy. They bite. Their teeth are sharp. You know? Because you know what? He's a puppy, not a possum. But he's still not completely right. We got the picture in him, right? But there's this puppy that just wants to be there. You call him, you show him a little food, he comes running. You know, he just, he just, he got to be smiling. You know, you're just a little puppy. The people, you and I are little puppies. And God is like, oh, it's so, so nice. And we run to God. Right 
there are times when the old possum shows up and we need grace. We need grace to be the puppet instead of the possum. And that was the, that's what this verse is talking about. Now I'm going to tell you there are some reasons why I think we don't need grace. So let me share them with you. First of all, I think it's ignorance. Say, I, did you just call me ignorant? I call this all ignorant. Ignorance gets us in trouble. Look at look look back at Hebrews chapter four verse sixteen. Look at what he describes as um, as the throne in chapter four verse sixteen. Well, actually, let's start at fourteen verse fourteen. Since then uh, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with, us, with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and, find, and may find grace and help in time of need. It's interesting that in verse 15 he says, who cannot sympathize, we have a priest who, who can sympathize with our weaknesses. That God assumes you have weaknesses. He assumes you and I have problems. He assumes that we will have struggles. He assumes that we will go back to being that possum at times. He assumes that we will go back to our old nature. He assumes that, and it's time you assume it. That you will have trouble. Now, most of you say, ah, I know that. It's very evident. And sometimes our wives and our husbands are very good to help us. And sometimes our friends. And, and hold us accountable, right? There are people there to help us and say, hey, you've got a weakness. Here is a struggle you're having. How can I pray for you? How can I help you? But if we're foolish enough to think that we don't have weaknesses, you won't find your grace. You have to be able to look at your heart and heart and say, there are troubles in there. God, I need grace. This last week, I spent a day and a half very troubled. Just troubled. Troubled. And I kept saying, Lord, what's wrong? What's wrong? Why am I troubled? What's what's happening? And Mary Jo said, Do you think one of our kids is going to hurt me? That's the first thing mamas always think about. Is that kid? Our grandkid? Ah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about you guys. <laughs> it wasn't the kids. I don't know what it was, but it, but God did speak to me and said, The trouble is in you and instruction gave me grace. But if you don't take the trouble of your life and the difficulties of your life that forces you to find grace in time of need. Look at, look at that last part of the verse. You can have confidence to go to the throne of grace that you may receive mercy and may find grace to help when? In the time of need. When you need it. This is an on-time grace. It is not a one-time grace. It's an on-time grace. It's when you need it. The moment you need it. But you have to go and get it. And sometimes we are ignorant and think, first of all, that we don't understand ourselves. We don't look for the grace. And we just go with it thinking, oh, well, I thought it was okay. And oh, dear, I'm not. So we're ignorant of our own troubles. But we are also ignorant that God has provided it for us. It's interesting to me that this is a throne. A throne of grace. When you think of a throne, what do you think of? You think of a king. Hmm? Something a king sits on. Something with authority. Something with power. Greater than yours. Often, we will think of a throne as a place where if you got called in, whether you like Queen Elizabeth or not, if you got invited into her throne room, how would you act? Respectfully. Or things would happen to you. You would give respect. You would feel respectful. You would feel like someone here is stronger than I. You would think, uh, I, I better be cautious. I better wear the right things. I better say the right things. I better bow the right way. Whenever you got to go in front of the queen or any kind of king, you always got taught how to bow, what to do. I remember watching uh, uh, about the, the emperor in Japan and how you were supposed to 
valve way back at the back of the room and kind of almost crawl up to a certain place but not too close and keep your head down and all kinds of things. Why? Out of respect. So a throne has with it the sense of respect and honor and power. And here's what he says. If you have, if you have a need and you need grace, you go with confidence. Now what does that mean that you go with confidence? It means you go knowing you're going to get what you need. It means if you're struggling with something, you have a God that you can go to his throne, his place of power, and get exactly what you need. And you can be confident. Confident. Some of you have been memorizing in your life builders uh, Hebrews 11. Verse 1. Anybody got that verse? What is it? No substance. Is the... No. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, I... Yeah, that's right. Faith. No, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Yeah, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith becomes the actual sub. I like that word substance. It's the stuff. Heaven is certain. Certain. When you got saved, if you did not express faith, you didn't have it. You say to someone after they pray to receive Christ or pray to give their lives to Christ, you say, are you saved? You go, I think so. Well, guess what? They didn't get it. Faith is knowing. Faith is the having, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It is a knowing. It is a confident knowing. And God says here in his word, if you have a problem and you need grace, go confidently to the throne where there is power to give you what you need. Have confidence. That's faith. God only honors faith. Sometimes we're just ignorant that there is a throne of grace that has power for you and for you. Not just others but for you. You have to be confident in a powerful God who is able to give you what you need, and you have to have confidence in the God who is able to give you what you need. Confident of Him, be confident He'll give it to you. There are a lot of Christians walk around with the troubles of their hearts saying, I don't deserve that. Never do you deserve. You're a possum who God has chosen. There isn't any of us who deserve to be chosen. Any of us who deserve to be chosen. Any of us who deserve God's grace. Except because of Jesus. And when you are in Christ, all of grace is available. <coughs> Ignorance keeps us from saying, oh God. It's for me. Be confident. Are you his child? Have you invited him into your life? Have you given him your life? Do you belong to him? Then get before him with your need and get the grace you need. It's a thing before you. The first problem is ignorance. The second is neglect. You get so wrapped up in the affairs of this world, you just forget so wrapped up in yourself, so wrapped up in the events of life, so wrapped up in the issues of work and bills and people and problems and sickness. It just gets tiring, doesn't it? Don't you just every once in a while wish you could just stop the whole world? Just stop. Talk about all kinds of disciplines. You know, work. To be honest, people, 
we're elementary in the discipline we're talking about. Reading your Bible, praying, remembering the scripture. Oh, yeah, that's, that's elementary stuff. When are you going to be take time for solitude? You adulteresses, what a way to start. You, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to you to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us, that he gives a, he gives a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Pride keeps us from going to God. I don't need it. I don't want it. I can do it on my own. I can do this thing. Yeah. 
if I can do months. That's the scripture most people know. But the scripture actually says is, without him I can do nothing. So which are you? Lots or nothing? I'll tell you, most Christians are lots. They think they can do quite a bit. When it gets really bad, I'll ask God for help. That's not being a Christian. Being a Christian is recognizing that even the minor things, we need Him. If you don't learn to trust Him in the little things, you will think you can do the great things, and you cannot and will not. And in fact, the little things become nothing more than legalistic things you do to get a pat on the back. If you were looking for a pat on the back, you don't need to be a Christian. There's only one who gets a pat on the back. That's Jesus. He is the one who does it in us. Anything else becomes idolatry. I don't need God. I can do it on my own. I can accomplish it. That's all about me. <coughs> Instead of God. You'll never get grace. So you say, I need it all the time. I'm looking for it all the time. God, I need your help. Lord, I need you to encourage me. You invited some people to the to the video. Lord, I need you to use it. Lord, speak through me. Lord, you do it through me. Lord, you bless us. And you let God take care of how he does it. But grace is only as good as you One person defined grace as God's riches at Christ's expense. Jesus has provided for you everything you need for holiness. Find God's grace in your time of need. Look at the very next verse here in, in uh, James chapter 4. It says in verse 7, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord. Arrogance, pride, I can do it. You will never find grace. Humble yourself and say, I need 